Welcome to the NAM Center for Korean Studies and our colloquium series. I have a um, couple of announcements. Uh, my name is David Chung. I'm one of the core faculty here at the NAM Center. And I also um, am faculty with the School of Art and Design. Um, unfortunately, tomorrow's special um, NAM Memorial Lecture with Ambassador An has been canceled due to the inclement weather. So that will not be taking place tomorrow. Um, a couple of things coming up to let you know about. One is on March 7th, on Monday, we have a screening of a um, award-winning film called Songs of the North with um, director Sun Mi Yu from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and she will be here in person. The screening will be at the um, multi-purpose room at the North Quad. And there's a flyer up there if you would like to see it. So really um, extraordinary film about um, her visits, like four or five visits to North Korea and about the songs and about the culture of North Korea, visual culture. Um, the next colloquium is on March 9th, and that is Sahi Kang, Planning Assessment in a Proficiency-Oriented Foreign Language Program. A, a backward design, I think that's a question. And we have our Korean film series as well. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's special speaker. Um, a couple of summers ago, in weather quite different from this, in Ho Chi Minh City, um, Vietnam, I was invited by the contemporary artist Ding Kyu Lei to come give a talk there and um, at one of the art centers. It's an amazing place, um, the former Saigon, and it's really full of life, a um, lot of thousands of scooters and um, just incredible art scene is, is growing there. And one day he, he invited me to a presentation given by Dredge Kang, and it was a, a really eye-opening um, evening. Um, just the transnational nature of pop culture, especially in Southeast Asia, where it is um, taking on a completely different form. For many years, K-pop, K-drama, and film have become the currency of Korean cultural capitalism and an important influencer. But what we see now are completely new and unforeseen hybrid yet original art forms and traditions developing and changing the cultural landscape of the region. I think Dredge will be talking to you about that this afternoon. Dredge Kang is a postdoctoral fellow in women, gender, and sexuality studies at Washington University in St. Louis. His research focuses on the intersections of queer and trans studies, critical race theory, and inter-Asian regionalism. He has published in a number of journals, and I won't go through them here because there's so many of them. But <laughs> uh, Dredge's dissertation, White Asians Wanted Queer Racialization in Thailand, explores the desire to embody and partner with white Asians or light-skinned Asians from developed countries. Dredge's second project, tentatively titled Amazing Waves, Queering East Asian Popular Culture Through Thailand, explores the impact of the Korean wave and cool Japan on the performance of Thai gender, sexuality, and race, as well as queer Thai influence in other Southeast Asian nations, such as, the Viet as Vietnam and the Philippines. Please help me in welcoming Dredge Khan. I want to start by thanking the NAM Center for inviting me. Can you hear me? OK, great. Um, I want to start off by saying that I'm an anthropologist. So the fact that I'm dealing with K-pop is a little bit unusual, because I'm not a, a, a media person, so to speak. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that I'm not a Korean specialist either. So I'm a specialist in Thailand. Uh, and how I came to this was through my own field work in Thailand when I was kind of confronted with the Korean wave from the Southeast Asian perspective. So that's how I'm actually coming to this. I'm not coming to it from a Korean studies perspective. So I just want to let you know that. OK. So kind of the broad question that I'm asking, I'm going to start with just some general comments, and then I'll go to reading the paper and showing slides and such. So the broad question that I'm asking is, why do gay, Thai gay sow, or what I'm calling sissies, and I'll explain that in a second, young feminine gay men, and Thai tom, or tomboys, 
who are like butch lesbians, embrace and embody Korean femininity and soft masculinity, or what are called flower boy aesthetics, through practices such as cover dance. And my short answer, so that if you tune out at any point, you can hopefully remember it, is that Korea represents a developmental step up that is nationally and personally within reach. Korea represents a non-Western developmental trajectory. And Korea is, in what's important for me, Asian. Right? So that's part of my work in uh, inter-Asia regionalism. So in summary, summarizing the argument, there are varying levels of degrees of cover dance and imitation. Um, one of the things I'll talk about is the signature move versus the song routine. But within this kind of practice, there are different levels of engagement with the practice of cover dance itself. And I'll talk about a group of people that I call demi-idols or hyperfans. And finally, I'm going to show how this relates to both kind of issues of race, queerness, and modernity in terms of the Asian context. Uh, why are these people engaging in this practice, and what are they getting from this practice? So I want to start by briefly mentioning my use of the term sissy, since this is not a common, it's not commonly used in a polite way in English. Uh, so there's also no good term for it in Thai either. The academic term is gay sao, which literally means girly gay. Um, the typical way that people will use the term in everyday speech is dut, which is the first term on this list. Um, but there's no good way of talking about this group of people. There's no good label for them. There's no self-identity label that everybody agrees on, etc. But in many contexts, particularly in Thailand and other parts of Asia, there's a kind of consensus that there's a category of people that you would call a sissy, which always assumes gayness, right? It's not just about uh, being feminine, but always also assumes gayness. And this is an emic perspective on Thai gender and sexuality from last year. These get posted online in Thailand all the time. Uh, so this one has 20 categories of different gender and sexual forms. One of the things that Thailand is known for is kind of uh, gender diversity. So in this person's creation, you see that they've divided humanity into males and females and then subdivided males and females into different groups. I've put the two arrows pointing to the groups that I'll be talking about. So this is, in her schema, it's labeled queen, but I'm going to call it sissy for uh, my purposes. And then the other one is the tom over on the female side. So those are the two groups I'll be talking about most. I'll be first talking about sissies, and later I'll be talking about toms. So cover dance is the covering of a song via dance rather than singing. This involves the copying of highly choreographed and regimented dance moves and other gestures to replicate a live performance or a music video. There is no irony in covering. That is, it's a simulation of the original rather than a parody. And that's a really key distinction to make. So if you've seen Gangnam Style, which is the one everybody's seen, Gangnam Style is already a parody, right? He is doing a parody of K-pop, and then people, when they cover him, are parodying him or um, doing a cover of him parodying K-pop. So that is the case that is against the norm. I just want to make sure you know that. In internationally popular K-pop, music videos are a primary source of consumption. The focus of these music videos is on a highly choreographed group dance sequence with signature moves for each song. So for example, in Gangnam Style, you know that the signature move is the horsey dance. And everyone that you know can do this move. Very few people haven't figured this out yet. You probably know some people who can do the foot swish, you know, go back and forth. You probably don't know anybody who can do the four minute routine for Gangnam Style from beginning to end, right? So that's a really important distinction because the people that I'm gonna be talking about, the cover dancers, they can do the entire routine to multiple songs, like over and over again. The other thing about K-pop is that there are certain genre conventions. The music video typically occurs on a literal stage. So the stage is a stage, and I'll show you what that looks like. With no musical instruments or microphones, minimal narrative elements, like it's not a little mini story. And the dancing is prioritized over the singing, so much so that group members are often not lip syncing to their own songs. Okay. And I'll show you what this looks like. So this is a, a screenshot of Girls' Generation, The Boys. You can see. They're on a stage, it's very fabulous, but it's obviously a stage that they're all on, and they're dancing in unison. And again, this is 
21, I am the best. Again, they're literally on a stage. It's a fabulous stage, but it's a stage. It's not like they're out on a mountain, you know, singing, doing things. Dance is a form of communication that uses body-to-body -body transmission. Given that Korean is an unfamiliar language to non-Koreans, and that the genre convention of K-pop focuses on dance, K-pop lends itself to covering via dance. And I refer to this practice more generally as embodied mimesis. It's kind of the embodying of Koreanness through the dance practice and through body motion as opposed through, through sound. In the do-it-yourself mashup post-post mechanical reproduction era of YouTube, and YouTube's one of the primary ways that people consume K-pop, K-pop songs do not lose their aura in being imitated. While many Western critics chide K-pop for being derivative, looking like it is already a mimicry of American pop music, in the world of K-pop, a music video gains its authenticity through imitation. In being copied by others, the number and diversity of covers and parodies points to the importance of the original. This incorporates intertextual generativity, including the covers of covers. A vast encirclement of the original endows it with an aura. I refer to this process as delayed authenticity. So in Benjamin's conception, you know, things that are easily reproduced lose their value. But what I'm arguing is in the world of K-pop, the more you reproduce something, the more it actually gains its value because then it points to the value of the original. So the fact that there are like a million parodies of Gangnam Style on YouTube shows how important Gangnam Style was. And the example that I use is the Wonder Girls Nobody. So this is pre-Gangnam Style. Uh, this was not a popular song in the US. It was the first Korean song on the US Billboard charts, but it was still not a popular song in the US. This is the Thai cover. And I wanna show you um, this group called the Wonder Gays which became the first famous group in Thailand, and they did a parody, not a parody, a cover of the Wonder Girls, and I'm gonna show you a clip from that. These are old YouTube videos, so the quality is really low, so I just wanna. So that's just a clip from it. Um, this was the first cover video, K-pop cover video in Thailand that went viral. It had over five million hits uh, for a long, I think Wonder Girls is JYP. So for a long time, JYP actually contacted them, gave them permission to keep it up on YouTube. But last year they made them take it down. So it's no longer available on YouTube. And I think that's part of the transition of K-pop's popularity around the world is that the idea of imitation is no longer considered beneficial by the corporations themselves. So this one was the first viral video and became a national sensation in Thailand and around the world. Um, and it brought a lot of notoriety to this group in particular and they called themselves the Wonder Gays. Now when I'm talking about this encirclement and the covering of um, K-pop videos and the covering of covers, so a lot of people, this is before Gangnam Style, a lot of people did nobody uh, covers. So this is CPRDC. I'm sure you've seen them do covers of songs like Michael Jackson, etc. Um, they also did a version of Nobody. In Thailand itself, one of the things that Thailand is famous for is ladyboy cabaret shows. So this is one of the most famous ones in Bangkok, which is um, Calypso Cabaret. And they incorporated Nobody into their routine on stage. It's the only contemporary song that they do a cover to. Um, and they incorporated the Wonder Gay rendition because in their version, 
the women are up there doing the Wonder Girls version, and then a group of boys runs on stage and displaces the Wonder Girls. So that means that they're actually the, the Wonder Gays. And then in the end, they all come back together to do a finale together to show that they all get along. But what, and then I've seen this rendition multiple times at this theater, and people in the audience laugh when the, when the boys go on stage. And what that tells me is that they know the Wonder Gay video, right? They don't know just the Wonder Girls video, but they also know the reference to the Wonder Gay video, because they would have no other kind of uh, use for laughing at that point unless they know why these boys are going on stage. So the Wonder Gays, because of this viral video, got a record deal with RSCM, which is the, one of the two large record companies in Thailand. And this was their promotional like, shot, so to speak. What I want you to pay attention to is the color of their pants. You can see that they're in this kind of rainbow formation. And what happens is that people start covering the Wonder Gays, right? So, it's not just that the Wonder Girls are being covered in all these different videos, but now the Wonder Gays themselves are being covered. And you can tell because people are doing things like matching the kind of clothing that the Wonder Gays are wearing in their video. And this comes full circle. You see all these kinds of images of this kind of rainbow pairing. And if you know the, the TV drama, Korean drama, Angel, they're doing the same kind of um, performance with the multicolored pants. When the Wonder Gay video was released, they were 15 and 16 years old. So that stage that you saw was at their high school, right? So that was part of the controversy, was that they were boys in high school, and they did the dance in front of the Thai flag, which is a national symbol, which was considered, um, sac it was considered sacrilegious for them to do the dance in front of the flag. Because they were so young, they had never been to a gay bar before. They had never seen a ladyboy cabaret before. They had no clue that any of these changes were going on kind of in Thai society at large. So one of the things that I did, I interviewed them a couple times, and one of the things that I did was when they turned 20, which is the legal age to drink in Thailand, I took them to a bar to show them part of the impact that they had in wider Thai society. Because the practice of cover dance, which they initiated through this video, or made famous through this video, then became replicated through the gay bar system, and I'll show you some images of that. But of course, they had no clue because they were too young to kind of comprehend what was going on. So K-pop cover dance in Thailand takes three primary forms. One is online video posts, which include documentation and commentaries. Two is a contest circuit that leads to the annual cover dance festival championship in Korea. And the Thai circuit actually predates the Korean international circuit. And then third is what I'm going to talk about more today, is participatory cover dance, or the practice of cover dance in gay bars. So now I'm going to focus on some of the convergent offline and online practices of Thai cover dance and explain some of their social relevance. So new media has been transformative in the manifestation of non-normative sexualities in Asia and other parts of the world. The internet, social media, and other technologies arrive concomitantly with the Korean wave in Thailand, or the population popularity of Korean entertainment media, thus enabling a synergy between them. In Thailand, K-pop cover dance has become a popular activity among sissies, young feminine gay men, and is organized into extensive international contest circuit. Thai sissies who cover Korean girl groups are among the most prolific prosumers, that's Jenkins' term, of K-pop. In addition to watching videos of K-pop girl bands, they reproduce these videos in their own YouTube responses. Cover dance groups such as the Wonder Gay have even achieved national celebrity. I have a paper coming out just on that group later this year in visual anthropology. Um, and part of it is that, the, is that they incited a gender panic through their viral video because the government and other people were concerned that people's impression of Thai masculinity was uh, effeminacy. In the rest of this paper, I describe contemporary shifts in Thai gender expression and gender identity influenced by East Asian media. I examine the interrelationship between K-pop online and its reproduction in the social practice of Thai cover dance. I argue that the elaboration of cover dance as ritualized performance and as social practice has provided a new medium through which Thai sissies express and embody modern Asian femininity, read as both an aspiration for national economic development and the instantiation of personal participation in a new cosmopolitan Asia. K-pop cover dance 
in Thailand highlights recent shifts in inter-Asian pop culture flows, uses of new media technology, and transgressive gender performance. In particular, it demonstrates the convergence of entertainment media with everyday recreational activity and novel ways of expressing racialized gender and sexual identities. So part of my um, work as an anthropologist is I'm not interested in media for its own sake or in analyzing kind of the text of the media. What's important for me is how the media is impacting kind of everyday practices in people's lives. Mediascapes are not continuous, but flow via lines of class, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality. Korean media is most popular in Thailand among the young urban middle class, women, and gay men. When K-pop was introduced to Thailand in the late 1990s, the genre consisted primarily of male artists targeted to female fans. As such, K-pop has become a medium for middle class Thai girls to express their individuality and trendiness. With the Korean Wave 2.0, K-pop also became associated with gay audiences. K-pop and cover dance are joked about in slang as gay pop. The only difference in being is the aspiration of the K. So many languages have this difference in terms of Korean included, have the difference between the G and the K sound, right? So K-pop and gay pop is a very minor distance, difference. It's just a change in the aspiration of the word. In Thailand, sissies pioneered cover dance with K-pop girl groups. Thus, there is an association between the trendiness of Koreanness, or the Korean wave, Grisa Gaoli, and the trendiness of queerness, or the Grisa Petisam. So you can see the, uh, the two renditions there. This is from a news program critiquing the Wonder Gay for, you know, for their feminine performance. Um, but they're clearly making this association between kind of the trendiness of Korean things and the trendiness of queer things in contemporary Thai space. Subsequently, cover dance became a popular activity among girls and has since expanded to Tom. The catalyst for the explosion of interest in cover dance in Thailand was the viral Wonder Gay YouTube post of Nobody, of the Wonder Girl song Nobody in February 2009, which garnered over 5 million hits. The popularity of this performance made Wonder Gay minor national celebrities, incited a gender panic, and effectively launched the cover dance phenomenon in Thailand. Cover dance contests are specific events, often sponsored by shopping malls, dance clubs, and conventions. Both popular downtown malls, such as MBK, and suburban malls, such as the Mall Bangkapi, support the contests. Malls are also practice sites. For example, Centerpoint, at the rear of the seventh floor of Central World, acts as a space large enough where over 30 groups can conduct practice sessions simultaneously. The groups that perform with names such as Boys' Generation can become semi-professional undertakings. These groups, comprised primarily of girls and sissies in high school and college, can participate in a circuit of competitions throughout the Bangkok metropolitan area and the country at large, often winning significant financial awards. For example, the monthly Hello Korea contest at MBK has a top prize, this was two years ago, of 30,000 Thai baht or 1,000 US dollars, which is the equivalent of a month's salary for a professional worker. So for the people engaged in this practice, they actually can make their living through the competition circuit. These competitions also prepare groups to compete for the annual cover dance festival in Korea. So I'm going to show you what some of these competitions look like. This is ICK, which is a, a gay bar that hosts competitions. I'm going to show you a brief clip from Boys Generation was a group that only covered girls generation songs, hence the, the name. And I'm going to show you a clip from um, Hoot.
So you probably can figure out what the signature move for that song is. Does anyone know it? Right. The bow and arrow. It's called bow and arrow move because someone's shooting your heart to make you fall in love with them. So that's in front of MBK. Um, the first time I met this group, Boys' Generation, was when they won the popularity vote for another rendition of a different Girls' Generation song that they did also at MBK. Now, the third kind of cover dance, what I refer to as participatory cover dance, is the most egalitarian. While routines are not as spectacular or perfected as those in online videos or contests, the mode of performance is unusual and attention-grabbing for those who have never experienced it. Participatory cover dance occurs in gay table dance clubs throughout Bangkok. The gay dance clubs in Bangkok can be grouped into several major zones. The highly international Siloam Soys 2, 2, and a, 2 slash 1 and 4, Soy Saracen, Otoko, RCA, Ratada, Mengjai, Ramkamhang, Lamsali, Lad Prao, Tongla, and Ekamai, and um, Thonburi, Pink Lao. There are many gay neighborhoods in Bangkok. I've witnessed PCD in all of these areas. However, it is relatively rare in Siloam, RCA, and Tongla, Ekamai, all more internationalized areas with Western and or Japanese patrons. Furthermore, while it is popular in many Thai bars, the style of bar does not always lend itself to cover dance. For example, in Atoko, dance bars are generally crowded to the point where you cannot move freely, like being on the subway during rush hour. These bars do not have dance floors or, stage or stages accessible to patrons. PCD is most elaborated in the Ratada, Mengjai, and Lamsali bars, which cater to students and service workers. And all these bars have um, large stages with catwalks that are accessible to patrons following live shows, which include drag shows, live bands, coyote boys, which are a form of exotic dancer, and variety acts. This also allows these bars to sponsor major cover dance contests. Patrons can also access the stage to perform their own cover dance traditions at will when there is no show. The majority of music in these venues is not Thai, nor Western, but Korean. So that was one of the first things that surprised me when I started going to these venues, was that you're in Thailand, but the majority of the music being played is actually Korean. And I'll give you, uh, show you some examples of what this looks like. When a popular K-pop girl group song is played, around 10% of bar patrons will spontaneously climb the stage and perform to the song in coordinated unison, as if in a flash mob dance. Because they are reproducing the regimented sequences from K-pop songs, their movements are synchronized, as if they were choreographed. Some patrons do actually coordinate with each other in advance. Particular aficionados will perform as a group within the larger scene. They may also bring props or coordinate outfits with those in their favorite music videos. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. So you saw that kind of image of a bar with a stage in the middle. So this is what the guys will do, they'll get on the stage, and this is nobody where they're doing the point. Um, they're doing bow and arrow move here from Hoot. And in these images, you can actually see that there's a video being played in the back, so they're also coordinated with what's on screen because everybody is coordinating to the same dance routine. So it looks like this ongoing flash mob of continuous K-pop cover dances. And I'll show you a short video clip to get the sense of what. So the people who are engaging in this practice, they know the entire routine for a repertoire of songs. So say, a routine is generally four minutes long. It takes you probably at least two weeks to learn a routine, right, from beginning to end. And some of these guys can do 20 or more routines in a night while these different songs come out. Whatever their favorite songs are, they'll do the routines to them. So that's how much they're invested in this embodiment of the, the song through this practice of cover dance. Covering is not a parody. Cover dance covets realness as fidelity to the original movements is emphasized. In contrast to ironic distancing, a highly effective verisimilitude of steps, gestures, and timing is prized. The communitas of freestyle or crazy dance, meaning dance where you do whatever you want, is not to be found in the cover scenario. 
where judgments of perfection are fiercely imposed. Sloppiness and goofiness are considered insincere performances. Thus, transgender cover dance is unlike ironic drag, which is also common in Thai gay bar performances, and provides a negative model of what not to be, a buffoonish rural Thai woman. As Manalan San notes, Filipino gay men recognize two modes of drag. The first attempts to mimic real women, while a second reveals the very constructedness of the mimicry through camp and theatricalization. For Thai sissies, the more appropriate analogy for realness would be a ladyboy or katoy cabaret show, where transgender women perform as women and passing is essential. In the US, the difference is often cited as that between female impersonators and drag queens. The former strives to present a realistic representation of a specific female icon, for example, Whitney Houston, while the latter creates personae around parody and reflexivity. These Thai sissies identify with Korean femininity in a way that white gay men sometimes identify with black femininity. A major difference, of course, is that the way that white gay males perform black femininity rehearses a downward mobility, while Thai males performing Korean femininity engages in aspirational upward mobility. Um, so I'm going to show you some images of the context of the other kinds of performances that are going on. So there's always drag performances, and drag in Thailand tends to be relatively realistic. So it's going for the kind of female impersonation type of image. So it can be of black Americans, and Thais have a very wide skin range, so they can be super light to super dark. So they do black performers without putting on any makeup. That's just their natural color. Um, but what's happened more recently is that there's this new infusion of K-pop into the scene, which allows them to perform a certain kind of Asian-ness within the scene. So before, um, where everything is either Western or Thai, the contrast is between the West and Thailand. But now there's kind of a layering of uh, modeling of aspirations towards a new kind of Asian-ness. And in these spaces, the only contemporary songs that are played that are foreign are Korean songs. So when they play, for example, a Chinese song, it'll be an older song, right? It's something that's from the past and it's nostalgic. But if it's something new, then it'll be a Korean song. And the contrast to this is always the Thai song. So in Thailand, Thai songs in gay bars are considered uh, inappropriate. So one of the bars that I used to go to often, the way that they drove patrons out at the end of the night was they would turn on Thai music. Right? And once the Thai music comes on, everybody leaves. It's like on cue, on mass, they leave. Because Thai music is considered low class for gay men. And gay male space is generally a very middle class space. So whenever Thai drag is performed, it's generally in this kind of very buffoonish, ugly way. And it represents a model of what not to be. It's the femininity that you don't want to access in comparison to other models that you see presented that are either Western or Asian. And this is an example of how you kind of create this, this look. It's the opposite of the uh, beautification, it's the uglification to be Thai. The imitation of Korean girl group dance performers proliferated in all classes of gay bars except those geared towards Westerners. As K-pop has come to represent Asian music, the management of DJ Station, the most popular dance club for foreigners, prohibits its play so as not to disturb Western clients. Thus, K-pop becomes an indicator of non-Western non Asian identification for the clientele of spaces where it is played, including the majority of local Thai gay bars in Bangkok. K-pop cover dance specifically allows one to imagine a self outside the cultural realm of the West in a pan-Asian context without acknowledging how the music or milieu is already hybridized via the West. In particular, cover dance allows Thai effeminate males to translate the spectacular embodiment of iconic Korean femininity in locally appreciable ways. And here I'm really pointing to the idea that, uh, like John Lee argues, there's nothing Korean about K-pop. It's just the brand for popular music. That's his argument. I would say that there is something Korean about K-pop. The idea is that with this kind of generic convention, even though it's basically the same as Western pop music, because it's branded a certain way, it allows for different kinds of identification for those people who are consuming it and performing it. Covering is highly effective labor. A great deal of time and energy is required to become like the star one is covering. 
Covered answers are not just prosumers in, participat in participatory cover, but what I call a hyperfan, in the sense of a fan who is so highly committed and emotionally attached to a star that he replicates her. Furthermore, in the case of competitive cover dancers, both in online video posts and in competitions, the cover group itself becomes famous and attracts its own fans independent of the original group. This layering of fandom drastically complicates the relationship between the production, consumption, production and consumption, creating multiple layers of parasociality or the more or less unidirectional interpersonal engagement between a star and a fan. Through the extreme consumption of hyperfans, the coverers who closely follow their idols through newspaper gossip columns, music magazines, web posts, tweets, etc., watch their concert videos and training videos, watch their fan cam clips and concerts and everyday lives, and their interviews and performances on television variety shows, go to fan club meetings and events and see them in concert, the covers are able to become highly intimate with the idol and imitate her bodily comportment, movements, gestures, personality, quirks, habits, and effective style. In this refashioning of the self, successful coverers become like their idols and gain the ability to perform as their idols. These enactments then attract fans for the follower, for the coverer. Thus, the popular coverer or hyperfan becomes a demi-idol in his or her own right, cultivating their own fan bases, albeit more accessible than the superstar being mimicked. And I'll show you what this looks like. So this is Boy's Generation. Uh, yeah, Boy's Generation, which you saw a video clip of before. This is out of costume, kind of when they're about to practice. And this is what it looks like when they're practicing. Um, if you know Bangkok, that's the uh, National Stadium BTS station in the background. So you know that this building that they're in is National Stadium, which used to be the National Stadium for the country, right? And now has been taken over by sissies, um, to I'm sure some people's chagrin. So this is Boys Generation's equipment. They use an iPad and an amplifier. So you can see that they just play the music video and turn on the amplifier. And so the whole stadium is uh, basically taken over by these groups of young gay men who are practicing to these uh, cover songs. And this is Central World Mall, which is the largest mall in Bangkok. They have a, this is the education zone. Many of the Thai malls, they like zone the areas based on kind of purpose and what's being sold. And you can see that there's not a lot of education going on here. So one of the groups that I've been following more recently um, changed the trend. So the earlier trend I was talking about was all about boys doing girl songs. So this group was the group that kind of switched that kind of dynamic in Thailand. And they're called Millennium Boy. And they specifically cover EXO. So I'll show you some images of them. So here's one of their images from a contest in uh, Uban Ratchathani, which is in the northeast of Thailand. They travel all around the country. And they won the International Cover Dance Festival in 2013, I believe. Um, and since then, they've become like judges for cover dance festivals throughout Thailand. So they hold their own uh, concerts as if they were stars, right? They have their own fan club. Their fan club, the girls call themselves Millennia because they're the Millennium Boys. They, like EXO, have a K version and an M version so that the group can divide and perform separately if necessary. Uh, this is one of their, this is a scene from post-performance, like behind the stage, where all the girls rush in and they try to take photos with the, these guys. And you can see that one of the girls has asked the guy to put on a little hat and take a selfie with it so that she can post it online. They hold fan meets. So these are, this is a cover group that's doing basically everything that a K-pop group would do, right? So this is a fan meet that they have. You can see that this is also National Stadium. Uh, this is um, a fan meet that they had that was sponsored by a milk company. So that's why there's a cow there. <laughs> Different kinds of events. Uh, one of the things that the fans also do is like K-pop fans, they create signs for their bands and they hold them up, up during their concerts. And like K-pop bands, they do things like apology videos. So this is a 23 minute long apology video that they did 
um, in 2014, I believe. And it's trilingual. It's, well, they speak it in uh, Thai and Korean, and then they subtitle it in English so that fans, because they have an international fan base now. Uh, a couple years ago, they had 130,000 fans. I don't know what they're at now. Um, and the reason why they have to do this apology video is SNM, they won, of course, for their, uh, their cover rendition of SM's EXO in Korea. After that, uh, SM thought they became too good. So <laughs> SM threatened to sue them unless they changed their logo, changed their branding, and basically stopped trying to be too much like EXO, right? Because they were basically imitating EXO as much as possible. So one of the things that they did was they changed their logo. Their logo used to look exactly like EXO's logo, but MB instead of EXO. And they changed their logo. This is them explaining, you know, why we cover us EXO and we got EXO's logo as our inspiration, so we want our logo to have the mood to be like theirs. But then, you know, they were required by the SM Corporation to change it because they were becoming too similar to the real thing. So they're actually doing all the things that a cover band would, uh, sorry, that a real K-pop band would be doing even though they're covering those real K-pop bands. And the other thing is that the fans treat them like they're a real band. So if you know about yaoi, this is a very common practice in East Asia where generally girls, these are young girls, create homosexual images or videos for each other's consumption. So it's similar to Slash in the US in that sense. So this, for example, is a clip from a concert where some young person has just taken a piece, of, snippet of that concert to make it look like these boys are lovers. They're actually band members. But what they do is they try to make them look like lovers. And the practice in Thai is called kuai. The Japanese word is yaoi. But the Thai word is kuai. And kuai sounds, surprisingly, like kawaii, the Japanese word for cute. Right, so what's generally produced now in kuai practices are images of K-pop band members. But what's happened is that now that there are these cover groups that are Thai of K-pop bands, and this is their old logo that looked like EXO, they make yaoi images of the cover groups just as if they were the real bands. Right, so this is what I'm talking about, the layering of the fandom and the parasociality. So these boys are both members of Millennium Boy, and they're band members, they're not lovers, but girls are posting photos of them to make it look like different ones of them are actually in homosexual relationships with each other. Right. And one of the things that I think is really important about this process is that it comes, this is a key moment. 1997 is a key moment for Korea and for Thailand because both go through the IMF financial crisis. Um, and this is something that I will write about since I need to write about it. But one of the things that if you ask me why Korea has come to take such a strong place in the Thai mediascape, one of the reasons is the 1997 IMF crisis. Because the two countries that were hit hardest were Korea and Thailand. Indonesia also suffered a lot. But one of the things that that meant was that Korean products in Thailand stayed the same price whereas Western products and Japanese products and European products all cost more. So Samsung, which was you know, a great company to begin with, had a new discount, right? Because now it was the same price as it was before, whereas anything from anywhere else was twice the price. And one of the things about the Korean wave in particular is that it's been a, an affordable wave. So that if you look at, for example, Japanese products, like Japanese cosmetics, they're quite expensive. Like if you look at Shiseido or any of those kinds of brands. So the average person in a developing country is not gonna be able to afford those products. Whereas if you look at the popularity of Korean products like cosmetics, they're at a much lower value, right? So these products are going out and they're at an affordable price point in Thailand for the middle class, which other products like Japanese products are not. And I think that that kind of materiality is something that people generally don't engage when they talk about the Korean wave, is that the Korean wave isn't just about the popularity of this media, but it's about the accessibility of the media and the products around it. And part of the popularity of the Korean wave is that you get a whole lifestyle, right? If you look at something like Japanese film, you get one kind of component of popular culture. But in Korea, you get film, you get drama, you get music, 
and then you get all the lifestyle products you see, for example, in the dramas. So you get to have that Samsung refrigerator too. Right? These are all kind of part of the um, cachet of the Korean wave. Okay. One of the things that's different too about how things are happening in Thailand from other parts of East Asia, and this is where I'm talking about regionalism as well, is that in the Kuwai Yaoi model, what you have is you have famous people, like K-pop band members, and they're put together into these imaginary couples because they're famous, right? So that's the formula. In Thailand, the reverse is actually happening as well, where you have cute boy couples who then become famous for the very fact that they're cute boy couples. And I think this is very specific to the Thai context where homosexuality and transgenderism are relatively well accepted compared to in other Asian societies. So in a place like Japan or Korea, you have to imagine that, for example, in, I'm sure you've seen K-pop uh, parodies where K-pop boy band members always cross-dress. This is like constant. They cross-dress, they do homoerotic um, yaoi activities in their performances. But there's always the presumption that they're heterosexual, right? You always know that the, the band members are actually heterosexual. They're just playing gay. Whereas in the Thai case, it's the opposite. The presumption is that they're gay. And then they take these gay boys. So uh, you've seen his image because he's, he, was in boys, he was in boys generation and then now he's in millennium boy. They take these cute gay boys who are what the image of the yaoi would be, but these are real couples as opposed to made up couples. And then because they're actual cute boy couples, they become semi-famous, right? So it's a reversal of the yaoi where Famous people become couples. Here you're taking couples and making them famous. And the last thing I want to talk about is kind of the new convergence because the kind of model for masculinity has been changing in Thailand. And as that model of masculinity has been increasingly inflected off of Korean flower boy aesthetics, it's changing what masculinity overall looks like. And one of the ways that this m is most interestingly for me, demonstrable, is in the convergence of sissy and Tom aesthetics. And I'll show you what I mean by this. Um, so you've seen the Millennium Boy before. I've shown you images of them. It's obvious that they're doing kind of K-pop boy band aesthetics, right? The colored hair, uh, the, the dress that they have on, etc. Now, Tom, who are the kind of easiest way to describe them in English would be like a butch lesbian. Um, are also doing these kinds of cover dance performances, but they're also modeling themselves off of K-pop boy bands, right? So they're modeling their masculinity off of flower boy masculinity. And this is the most popular Tom recording artist in uh, Thailand. Her name is Z, so her uh, kind of record title is Tom Z, because Tom just refers to her as being a butch lesbian. And you can see from these images, her aesthetic is like the K-pop boy band, flower boy aesthetic. So what that means is in everyday life now, Sissy and Tom aesthetics have merged. So before in public space, Sissy's and Tom's had very different public presentation because the Tom's had a very masculine public presentation because their masculinity was kind of this butch macho-ness. But now you see the Tom on the right, and this is a, one of the members of Millennium Boy on the left. Um, their aesthetics have converged on this flower boy masculinity. So sometimes in public, you can't tell the difference, whether somebody is a sissy or a Tom. And one of the things I was doing research on last summer was talking to Toms about how they are using kind of flower boy aesthetics. And they would say things to me like, oh, we can't tell anymore. And Interestingly, they would tell me things that like gay men talk about, uh, especially in terms of transgender women. They would say things like, you have to look for the Adam's apple, or you have to listen to the voice, or you have to look at the hands. So they're using the same kinds of registers that have been traditionally used in Thailand with uh, transsexual women to differentiate them from men. And now they're using them you know, with sissies and toms to differentiate uh, amongst them as well. Here's another image. The one on the right is another member of Millennium Boy, and you see kind of the, the Tom version of that. So part of this too is I would suggest that there's a new configuration of Tom identity in Thailand that's also 
made possible by K-pop aesthetics, right? And one of the things that's changed dramatically in the configuration of Tomness is the idea that Toms can be in relationships with each other. So uh, there's a ethnography by Megan Sinat called Toms and D's from 2004. And in that um, uh, book, she argues that it's not possible for a Tom to be in a relationship with another Tom, because that's not a conceptual, that's not a conceivable pairing for a butch lesbian to be with a butch lesbian. And historically, the pairing has always been what's called the Tom D pairing. So you always have one person who has short hair and wears pants, and one person who has long hair and wears dresses. Right? So the pairing had to be that. So it's similar to uh, a heterosexual pairing in that it's heterogender. Even though they're the same sex, they're playing different gender roles. What's happened more recently is this phenomenon of what's called Tom Gay. And because a Tom identifies with masculinity, if you have two Toms together, they're called gay. Right? So the term for them is Tom Gay, or it's abbreviated TG. And I would argue that this new sexual configuration, where this is now made possible, is in part because of the softening of Tom masculinity that's occurred through their adoption of Korean uh, flower boy aesthetics. Uh, the last part I want to talk about um, is kind of how race plays into this too. So I haven't talked about race very much in this talk, but for me it's really important that people read certain kinds of whiteness as Asian as opposed to as Caucasian. So some of you may have seen this ad. It, came, uh, it was in the news a lot in December. So CNN ran an article, The Guardian ran an article on it. Because it's for a skin lightening product and you have the light version and the dark version of a woman. And she's basically saying, you know, if, if you're light skinned, you'll win. You know, you'll be the winner. Um, so these kinds of ads are critiqued all the time in Western media. One of the things that the Western media generally doesn't point out, though, is that they're not talking about wanting to be Caucasian, right? And that's where I'm trying to change one of the registers of inter-Asian studies and looking at Asian regionalism, is that when Thais are modeling whiteness, they're calling Koreans and Japanese white. So you'll notice that the product that this ad was for is called Soul Secret, which is clearly a reference to Korea. Seoul, Korea, right? But this is read in a Western framework as wanting to be Caucasian. And part of my argument is that within this new inter-Asian regionalism, that this is actually kind of an identification with Asian whiteness that's tied to Japanese and Korean bodies and not to Caucasian bodies. Okay. And I just wanted to really quickly show you a clip. Um, one of the things that's also happening is that What's happening in Thailand is also being disseminated. So you have things like uh, cool Japan media coming in. You have things like um, Korean wave media coming into Thailand. But Thailand is also disseminating its own media and also indigenizing and rebranding the media that's coming in from places like Japan and Korea. Um, so there are outright copies of Korean bands in Thailand. For example, there's a group called Seven Days, which is basically a version of Girls' Generation. And those have been around for a long time. What's happened more recently is this new
So I'm going to conclude. Uh, finally, I propose that transnational, transgendering, and Thai K-pop cover dance opens up new possibilities for imagining and embodying the Thai self, not only as queer, but also as Asian and economically developed. The Wonder Gay, who are the first cover group to achieve national fame in Thailand, spearheaded the explosion of K-pop cover dance and associated with sissies. Indeed, during my first interview with them, I asked them the unspeakable question, are you gay? Um, their answer was no. Uh, we are not gay, we are not masculine at all. We are tut, which means sissy. So this was kind of looking at how they're identifying their gender sexuality in reference to the K-pop cover. What remains left unsaid is that Korea has come to represent a model for Thai development. Even as wonder gay critics chastise them for copying a Korean group, espousing Thailand's, uh, exposing Thailand's belatedness, these very social commentators stated that what would be, um, what should be imitated is not Korean music, but rather Korean national character, especially diligence. A common rejoinder among Wonder Gay supporters was that cover dance performers did, in fact, demonstrate diligence and hard work to achieve their level of performance mimicry. Indeed, I want to make a connection to development by highlighting the expansive growth of the Thai middle class post-1997 IMF crisis, which severely affected both Thailand and Korea. During this time period, the West also lost favor as the model for economic development, as Western investors were blamed for the financial speculation that caused the Thai economy to crash. But I also want to make another claim. Hallyu, or the Korean wave, and its localization is not just about the rise of Korea. It should also be understood as the rise of China, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, and other countries that have developed a large middle class consumer base for for the consumption of Korean popular culture products. This fits a wider pattern of recent Thai engagement with East Asia, what Jackson refers to as the Asianization of Thai queer cultures. The Thai localization of K-pop cover dance, specifically, expands the performative range of gender, both staged and for broader audiences, and enacted in the confines of gay spaces. Yet the refashioning of gendered as feminine and racialized as Asian performance not only creates new modes of fandom and participation in the production, consumption, and recirculation of K-pop, but also provides new opportunities for Thai sissies to identify with effeminacy and modern Asianness. Thus, I read Thai K-pop cover dance as an allegory for Thai national aspirations for development and actual participation in an emergent cosmopolitan Asia. Thank you.